Robert, welcome. Thanks. Uh, you know, I talked offline before. You know, you're uh, got some an interesting topic that uh, I think is something that we don't hear about every day, but it's certainly of an interest to, to most people. I think it's interesting to, to people that have a head. So I think it'll introduce interest, I suppose, most people out there. So if you don't mind, could you give us a little bit of a background information on yourself? Sure. Uh, so my name is Rob English. I am a medical editor. I'm a peer-reviewed researcher who specializes in hair loss disorders. Uh, and I'm also on the editorial board of a dermatology journal called Dermatology and Therapy. Um, my life revolves around researching hair loss. So that can range from anything from androgenic alopecia, also known as pattern hair loss, all the way to alopecia areata, autoimmune forms of hair loss, telogen effluvium, chronic telogen effluvium. Uh, and I also run the website Perfect Hair Health, which basically showcases evidence-based approaches for hair regrowth with the drug model, without the drug model. What doesn't really, it doesn't really matter to me which pathway somebody decides to choose. What matters to me is their access to information. And um, my interest in this area uh, started all out of self-interest. So when I was uh, 17 years old, still in high school, I was diagnosed with male pattern hair loss. I spent the next several years fumbling through different treatment options, desperate for a solution. Uh, I ran into some bad information online about certain drug interventions, which scared me away from certain drugs. Uh, that led me down a pathway where I became really obsessed with trying to find an option outside of the drug model. And the long story short is that because of that misinformation, I ended up spending six years and $10,000 on scientifically baseless treatments that were really well marketed to me, uh, but were functionally useless. And um, I think that hair loss in general is a unique industry in the sense that profit incentives disadvantage the consumer at every single level. So I'm talking about online, I'm talking about at a doctor's office and then a dermatologist's office and for completely different reasons. So when you start losing your hair, typically the first thing that somebody does is they'll go online and they'll say, oh, you know, well, what causes hair loss? They'll type it into Google. And um, the Google search algorithm doesn't prioritize educational resources of substance. Rather, it prioritizes what's known as infotainment. And what infotainment means is how long can your eyes stay on a screen and how far can you scroll down and how many links will you click into in a single article that you're reading. And so when you type in what causes hair loss, you're going to reach top ranking articles from Healthline, Medical News Today, um, some natural health websites that'll tell you these listicles, of like the 10 top foods that are causing hair loss and what you need to stop eating to cause hair loss and nutrient deficiencies that are driving hair loss. And there's some truth to that. But the problem is, is that it's all context specific. And we've talked about this offline where um, context always matters in the, in the realm of nutritional resource. So um, there's this incentive for infotainment whereby you get these listicles and you end up in this situation where you read what you ostensibly believe to be peer reviewed or medically edited articles that suggest that a biotin deficiency might be driving hair loss. And then there'll be a reference that, that supports that claim. And what the context of that article will leave out is the fact that essentially um, biotin deficiencies are absolutely causative in hair loss if you're a child in the developing world with a biotinidase deficiency, which is a genetic mutation that's found in about one in 110,000 individuals. So not really applicable to your everyday developed world pattern hair loss sufferer. Um, and yet biotin sells hundreds of millions of dollars per year in supplementation, despite its functional uselessness in the hair loss realm for the overwhelming majority of sufferers. And you'll also find this relationship over and over with things like iron deficiencies, um, B12 deficiencies, and their relationship to specific hair loss disorders. And people end up just blowing so much money on nutritional supplements that are functionally baseless. And so say if you don't go into that online world and you type in what causes hair loss, say if you just go to a doctor's office because you want an expert opinion, you're most likely going to go to your primary care physician. And um, primary care physicians are incredibly, diff they're, they're incredibly busy. And um, their profit model is such that they're only going to have time to spend about seven minutes with you before they need to move on to the next patient. So they're most likely to diagnose you with what's the most common type of pattern or the most common type of hair loss uh, in the developed world for adults, which is androgenic alopecia or pattern hair loss. But they won't do a full health evaluation and they won't necessarily tell you, um, you know, uh, 
what kind of drivers of specific chronic conditions or stress-related ailments can drive other types of hair loss. And so they're generally going to just give you a prescription for finasteride, stop start telling you to take minoxidil, and then send you on your way and hope that those things work. And for a lot of people, they will, but for some people, they won't. Now, say if you went to a specialist, a dermatologist, what's unique about them is that they have the capacity to now examine your scalp, potentially do a biopsy, hone in on a closer diagnosis, and they're upwards of spending about 20 minutes with you, but their profit incentives are different. So dermatologists don't make money off of prescribing Propecia or uh, telling you to take Rogaine. Rather, their profit incentives are built around trying to sell you into low-level laser therapy devices, platelet-rich plasma therapies, stem cells, PRP plus A cell. Um, the latest thing is exosomes and basically any intrabody derived treatment that you can imagine. And um, there's some clinical support for these things. Uh, typically, if you continue these therapies, you'll expect about a 10 to 30% increase in hair count across most hair loss disorders. But the problem is, is that um, what these dermatologists don't tell you is that these treatments cost thousands of dollars. The results are generally contingent upon lifelong use. So you're locked in forever. They're incredibly expensive and that you can get those same ballpark increases to hair counts by buying a microneedling device on Amazon for $15, which is less than 1% of the price of a single PRP session. So there's all these profit incentives that disadvantage consumers at every single level. And the reason why I started Perfect Hair Health was basically to help prioritize education rather than product purchases for most people. So that's my background. Thank you. That was uh, fairly extensive. Um, you know, obviously you've got a lot of hair. So, I mean, you've, you've, you know, for every your particular reason, you know, you've, you've certainly solved that. I started losing my hair in my twenties. And so I just, you know, hasn't, uh, unfortunately it was something that I, I you know, we talked about, um, you know, the different potential etiologies of hair loss and, and there's probably some commonalities and common things and some that are less, less common. So when you say, you know, we've got these nutrients, poor kids in Africa starving of biotin deficiency, obviously that's not the average American. Uh, you know, I think we both agreed that hair loss seems to be accelerating in the pot on a population level. At least there's some data to support that. And you talked about studies in China and other places like that. So in your view, I mean, what's, you know, if you had, if you had to just guess without looking at somebody, somebody said, hey, I'm losing my hair, what, what is the cause or what are the major causes of hair loss that are common that, that most people would probably have trouble with? It's a great question. I fear that my answer might even be more long-winded than my uh, introduction of myself. <laughs> um, basically, when you're thinking about the causes of hair loss, you have to segment those causes into any type of hair loss disorder. So you've got a few different types of hair loss. We talked earlier about pattern hair loss, then there's telogen effluvium and alopecia areata, which is more autoimmune driven. But if we just look at the two main types of hair loss in the developed world, for probably people who are gonna be watching this presentation and have an interest in the carnivore diet and just uh, general health, um, there's pattern hair loss, which is also known as androgenic alopecia. And this type of hair loss disorder is ubiquitous across almost all adults. It's so common that you can't walk down a city block without seeing somebody with the actual condition. So for men, it typically presents as hairline recession or temple thinning, and then a, like a bald spot forming at the crown. Um, and it can progress over years, over decades to a completely slick bald scalp. In women, it's more so diffuse in patterns. So you won't necessarily get somebody who goes completely bald, but they'll lose hair evenly across the top of the scalp right here. And so um, what drives this condition? Well, the main consensus is that this condition is mediated by both genetics and androgens. So there's several gene sets that are responsible for the predisposition to androgenic alopecia. Then there's also male hormones, specifically a testosterone metabolite known as dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And so if you walk into a doctor's office, typically the explanation that you're going to get for um, what causes pattern hair loss is that it's your genes and your hormones, and you got to target DHT to improve pattern hair loss. And um, there's evidence to support that this really works well. Finasteride is a, a type of drug that lowers DHT. 
and it can lead to an improvement of hair counts by about 10% over two years for 80 to 90% of the men actually taking that drug. So we know that DHT is both a, a causal agent that mediates this uh, hair follicle miniaturization and that type of hair loss. And we also know that lowering DHT can improve pattern hair loss outcomes. So that's the first bracket of hair loss. The second bracket of hair loss is this really big category known as hair shedding disorders. And hair shedding disorders can basically de be defined as um, a disruption to the hair cycle. And so what I mean by that is that our hair goes through these two to seven year stages of growth, then rest, then shedding. And at any given point, about 85% of our hairs are in the growing stage and 10 to 15% of hairs are in their resting or shedding stages, also known as the telogen stage. And there's a type of hair loss or hair shedding disorder known as telogen effluvium and chronic telogen effluvium. And these types of hair shedding disorders are generally driven by a disruption to the hair cycle itself. So too many hairs shed out at once and too few hairs grow back in, leading to what appears to be less density across the scalp. Now, this can be driven from a variety of factors, but the big ones are stress that can be emotional, physiological, surgical related, whereby uh, the adrenal glands over pump for a long period of time and dysregulate the hair cycle it can be due to nutrient imbalances like ferritin, vitamin D, um, vitamin B12, even biotin, if you are uh, one of the unlucky ones with a biotinidase deficiency. Um, and then it can also be driven by chronic conditions, things like hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism. There's even evidence that gut dysbiosis and small bacterial, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can drive hair shedding disorders. And then there's also medication use. So certain antidepressant drugs, um, certain non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can drive uh, an increase in the signaling proteins that stimulate the shedding phase of that hair cycle and thereby dysregulate those hairs. The difference between male and female pattern hair loss and hair shedding disorders is that with hair shedding disorders, hair shedding disorders are almost entirely temporary. So after the unique cause arises in the body, about three to eight months later, you'll see symptoms of the hair shedding. You'll get that dysregulation of the hair cycle but if you address those causes, within three to eight months, the hair typically begins to recycle, return to a normal hair cycle, and you see a return to the hair volume within a year period, a two year period. So in the absence of pattern hair loss, hair shedding is completely temporary. You address the underlying cause, you can fix it entirely, which is really exciting. With pattern hair loss, this is more chronic and progressive. And this is because pattern hair loss is defined through what's known as hair follicle miniaturization. And um, essentially what ends up happening is that when you look at the histology of uh, pattern hair loss, um, the hair follicles miniaturize over a series of hair cycles. So they get thinner and thinner and thinner. But what's interesting about pattern hair loss is that that thinness doesn't happen actively as the hair is growing. Rather, if you measure the hair diameter at its tip and at its root from a shed hair that's undergoing androgenic alopecia, the diameter stays exactly the same. What ends up happening is that you have to shed that hair as part of the natural hair cycle. Then the old hair follicle degenerates, again, totally part of the natural hair cycle. The new hair follicle regenerates to take its place. Again, this is part of the normal hair cycling process. But in AGA affected regions, the dermal papillae cell cluster, which rests at the base of the hair follicle, comes in as a little bit smaller in cell count. And the dermal papillae is basically the powerhouse of the hair follicle. It directly influences the sizing of that follicle. And so when a smaller dermal papillae forms, you get a tinier hair follicle and thereby a thinner hair strand. So the entire miniaturization process of pattern hair loss is progressive for that reason. And it only happens in between shedding stages, which creates this really interesting problem. And it's basically the first node of misinformation that consumers face, which is if pattern hair loss can only progress through stages of shedding, then if you look at a population level, almost everybody will go through bouts of temporary telogen effluvium and shedding. Um, as part of just living in life. You'll, you're bound to develop a low-grade nutrient deficiency at some point. It's really easy to slip into subclinical hypothyroidism if your, di if your diet sucks. Um, it's really easy during a pandemic to feel incredibly stressed or catching coronavirus to notice a, disrupt, uh, a disruption to the hair cycle. If you have 
just telogen effluvium, then in the absence of pattern hair loss, that hair comes back. But for the overwhelming majority of individuals, 90% plus people present with hair follicle miniaturization after puberty. It's ubiquitous. The question is, how fast will it develop in any individual? And telogen effluvium-based shedding accelerates that process because it accelerates the hair shedding cycle. Now, the irony is that in order to regrow hair, you also have to shed hair because you have to create an opportunity for that dermal papillae to resize. So the causes really depend on the individual. Um, for the overwhelming majority of people, it's genetic, it's androgenic. Um, there's also secondary factors that involve its um, you know, ability to recover hair, which involve fibrosis and other signaling proteins. Um, and there's other factors that we can talk about now, but those are the big ones. Um, and I know, you know, I know we've got a lot, a lot to cover here. Somebody just wants to touch on outside of hair loss, there's concern about gray hair. And I know we kind of touched on that a little bit as to why people are going gray. And then, then we can talk about solutions, you know, what, what are the things that seem to, to maybe mitigate these problems or fix these problems? And then I guess on top of that, you know, we're, we're the, I think we're one of the few species, mammal species that doesn't have hair over our entire bodies. I mean, most mammals, you know, my dogs, other primates are all hairy. Is there an advantage to not having hair? What is it? I mean, what, what is the, and, and why do we lose hair and why do we have hair in certain spots? I'm just wondering what the evolutionary advantage of having hair on top of our head and our armpits and groin and, you know, as opposed to other places. I don't know if you want to get into that, but let's start by the gray hair stuff first, and then we'll talk about some of these other things. Sure. So um, with gray hair, basically pigment is produced by melanin um, and melanin is produced by melanocyte cells. Uh, and so with gray hair, what ends up happening is that there's a dysregulation to either the melanocytes that sit at the hair bulb or the melanocyte stem cells. And so with hair cycling, it's this innately inflammatory process. Stem cell depletion will happen over a series of decades. Um, and if the melanocyte stem cells become depleted for whatever reason, then you can end up producing fewer melanocytes and thereby you can produce you know, less pigment to your actual hair. Conversely, you can also see damage to the melanocytes themselves. And there's a difference between what's considered genetic graying versus non-genetic graying. And it's basically a step process of where that damage is taking place. So if you're seeing damage to the melanocyte stem cells, it's largely considered irreversible. If those are depleted, then technically speaking, um, it's age-related graying, it's tough to reverse. If you're seeing damage to the melanocytes themselves, then that is reversible. In fact, um, I uh, recently noticed a gray hair on my chest and when I plucked it out, because I don't like to see them, I noticed that it had actually converted back to dark hair in the middle of its hair cycle. And this is a phenomenon that happens pretty regularly. So if anybody has graying hair, you'll notice that a fraction of the hairs that are graying will actually convert back to black hair or dark pigmented hair uh, in the middle of their hair cycle, which suggests that for a lot of cases, that's likely just damage to the melanocytes and this is reversible. So I say that in the sense of those are the step processes that can lead to graying. Um, what are the causes? Well, the range is massive and nobody really has a straightforward answer. Um, oxidative stress in the hair follicle bulge is considered probably one of the biggest drivers, um, but there's debate over what's driving that oxidative stress. For the longest time, people thought, oh, it's UV radiation, it's gotta be UV light. You're out in the sun, you're exposing yourself to more oxidative stress through um, UV rays. Uh, but then there were these observational studies on farmers who didn't wear hats compared to the age-controlled people who uh, were not farmers and they had no increased rate of graying. Um, and this is a pretty consistent finding across several studies. And so there's been a lot of questions as to what's driving it. Is it a nutrient deficiency? There's evidence that copper, um, copper ions are responsible for melanocyte production. And so a copper deficiency is actually associated at a population level with an increased rate of graying. Um, so there's a few different things that could be going on there. It's, it's really unknown uh, and it's still an area of exploration. At the same time, there have been interesting case reports whereby you have really old people who see a complete depletion in their stem cells for melanocytes. And uh, they start taking a drug for something like lymphoma. And six months later, the stem cell bulge repletes, their melanocytes re regenerate, and they've got black hair after years of being completely gray. 
So even though the step process is considered irreversible at the stem cell bulge, it seems like we still have case reports of people repleting those cells by accident just by certain drug use. So it's a really interesting area of research and it suggests to me that anything is basically regenerative. regenerative. It's interesting with the drug side effects, you know, this, it's probably, you know, we, throw, we, we, we market a drug for whatever reason, we notice, oh, well, by the way, these people had this result. And I think that's how things like minoxidil were discovered, you know, it's just kind of like, or, you know, Viagra, I think was discovered, you know, something along those lines. And so they, they market it for another reason. But then there's also the sort of the negative side effects that, that eventually occur that no one, <laughs> that doesn't get marketed to as much. We've talked about, you know, some of the causes, and, and I know you've got some uh, some uh, actual uh, case reports you want to show. And let, let's talk about, you know, if we've identified the cause and how, how can we potentially fix it? That's a great question. So the causes of hair loss for pattern hair loss are mainly DHT related and genetically related. So most people will want to target that through drug interventions such as finasteride, which is a type 2 5 alpha reductase inhibitor. It lowers DHT levels by reducing the amount of free testosterone that converts into DHT. Another possibility is dutasteride, which um, is even a more powerful DHT reducer. It lowers both the type one and type two isoforms of 5-alpha reductase. So you get a near complete DHT suppression, almost to castration levels while still maintaining testosterone. Um, for the most part, the clinical evidence on these drugs is really impressive. But the problem with these drugs is that generally they're only relegated to stopping pattern hair loss and marginal improvements to hair counts. So this kind of leads into this big question as to, well, okay, if DHT is the driver of pattern hair loss and uh, lowering DHT to near castration levels should stop the problem, how come hair follicles aren't completely reversing? And it seems like there are these histological markers that accompany balding scalps that prevent full recoveries in many cases perhaps the majority of cases. One of those rate limiting recovery factors is something known as fibrosis or scar tissue. So as these hair follicles cycle, you'll end up facing these environments where when the new hair follicle comes in, the inflammation around the structure itself ends up leaving some debris that turns into scar tissue over time. So basically the opportunity to resize those hair follicles diminishes with each single hair cycle. If there's more fibrosis that has occurred around each hair cycle, it gets harder and harder and harder. So in my personal experience, I think it's important to not only just target DHT, but to target this potential for fibrosis and diminishing and attenuating and potentially even partially reversing fibrosis. And what's interesting is that there are a lot of clinical ways to do this. Um, Several are through what's known as maybe stimulation-based therapies. So we mentioned PRP earlier. Um, another version of that is microneedling, whereby you deliberately wound your scalp with a tiny little medieval torture device-like needles uh, to basically create inflammation, send signaling proteins that uh, turn on the antigen or growth stage of the hair cycle. And in doing so, you also promote a situation whereby um, you can end up uh, diminishing some of that scar tissue and allowing for larger resizing of the hair follicles. Now, that's like the medical route plus some stimulation-based therapy route. There's also some secondary factors that I have emphasized in my research that I find really important in pattern hair loss uh, pathology that don't necessarily get as much attention but are beginning to get a little bit more attention too. And actually boils down to the morphological and the structural changes of the scalp itself as somebody undergoes the balding process. So one example of this is the contraction of the perimeter muscles that surround the, the scalp. Sorry, I thought you were about to say something. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, if you talk to any dermatologist who has access to most people's scalps, about 80% of dermatologists, or sorry, 80% of patients through dermatologists will have what's known as a very tight scalp. And it seems like that tightness is a result of the involuntary and chronic contraction of the scalp perimeter muscles, um, the occipital muscles, the frontalis muscles, the periauricular muscles. And basically for reasons not fully understood, um, these muscles create, uh, these muscles contract for, for unknown reasons in men who are losing their hair. 
Um, interestingly enough, if you model these out in two-dimensional von Mises models, you'll see that the tension patterns between the occipital and frontalis muscles, when you clamp those down, they perfectly align with the patterning and the progression of somebody's pattern hair loss. So you see tension points highest where hair loss begins. And if you control for head size, you can actually mimic the same relationship with female pattern hair loss that looks more diffuse. So this has led to this question, well, does this have any potential pathology in pattern hair loss? And, and if so, what can we do about it? Now, what's interesting is that earlier you mentioned that we're a mammalian species that doesn't have a lot of hair. We technically have, you know, 2 million plus hairs all over our body. They're just very, very tiny and very, very fine. But one of these, uh, big things that people have wondered about in the hair loss world is, well, you know, if you're losing your hair up top, how come you grow a bunch of body hair and chest hair and back hair? Uh, what's going on? Why is there this great migration between this hair that we want to keep up at the top of our scalps? Why does it go to our body? Um, and it seems like that hormone DHT, which is implicated as a mediator of pattern hair loss and hair follicle miniaturization, that hormone is also associated with hair growth in the chest, in the face, in the beard, uh, throughout the body. And it's this really interesting relationship where you have a paradox between the hormone that causes hair loss at the top of the scalp and the same hormone that actually grows hair throughout the rest of the body. And this is something that most researchers chalk up to genetic variants. Um, you know, gene, the gene argument is kind of like this Blake and state blanket statement that most researchers use to, to basically explain away anything that they can't explain in pattern hair loss research. And so it's a little bit annoying to face this. But what's interesting is that you can actually create a model by which scalp tension or the contraction of these scalp perimeter muscles can change the way that DHT behaves. Now, when you look at the reasons why those dermal papillae cells shrink in number, it's because DHT, when it arrives to those cell sites, it induces a signaling protein called transforming growth factor beta one. What this ends up doing is it ends up leading to apoptosis of those cell structures. And so you end up leading to a lot of cell death and the numbers are smaller, the hair follicle grows smaller, and then you get a smaller hair. And that process continues, continues, and continues. Well, in balding facial tissues in the chest, um, you know, that relationship doesn't happen. DHT doesn't induce the same growth factors. And so why is that? And this hasn't been fully elucidated yet, but one argument that I found very interesting is that under chronic tension, DHT becomes more likely to mediate transforming growth factor beta one. And what's interesting about that is that we see this relationship potentially not just in balding scalps, we also see it in prostate tissues. We also see it in um, the eyelids of patients with Graves' disease. Essentially, any point of contraction where there's chronic tension across the top of the scalp or chronic tension in the tissue, you're bound to increase the mediation of DHT and the arrival of transforming growth factor beta one. So another potential driver of pattern hair loss and another potential target is that when these muscles contract, they basically pinch the branches of the carotid artery, which run through both sides of the neck. Now, when you pinch those with, uh, when you pinch those branches of the carotid artery, you reduce blood flow to the top of the scalp and the carotid artery is indirectly the main supply of blood that, uh, you know, reaches the top of the scalp. What's interesting is a secondary factor to this is that we know that environments of hypoxia where there's lower blood flow and presumably lower oxygen levels as well, that free testosterone actually favors the conversion, not into estradiol, but into DHT. And so what we end up seeing is that if you can take these muscles out of chronic contraction, you can also improve pattern hair loss outcomes beyond what is just capable with the drug approach, like finasteride or dutasteride, or even growth stimulants like monoxidil. And this has been demonstrated in at least five clinical studies so far with botulinum toxin or Botox, basically injecting Botox around these scalp perimeters, loosening the scalp, presuming, presumably increasing blood flow, uh, reducing scalp tension, and improving hair count outcomes on par with what finasteride does. Now, the evidence here is of lower quality. It's not like those clinical studies that were done by Kaufman with finasteride, but it is just this interesting anecdote that suggests that there might be this paradoxical relationship between DHT 
as a result of the fact that we have these involuntarily contracted muscles around our scalp perimeter. So it's one potential thing that can, you can also target. Um, another thing that you might also be able to target is DHT production in the gut, which is why I wanted to first connect with you and what we had a conversation about. Um, because up until recently, we had no idea how much DHT activity actually is in the gut and um, how much our gut microbiome and potentially our diets influence that activity. Yeah, and just I'm just looking through the chat. I've got a couple of people saying here. I went on, you know, I'm on this carnivore diet. My my hair shedding has improved. Other other things, and, and you know, we you and I have talked about that. I know you've got examples of that. So, yeah, let's let's chat a little bit about how um, you know, obviously, you know, Botox around the head is not practical for for everybody. And you know, I I think that you know, with this contention, you know, some people say, well, maybe you can massage it a certain way. Again, that's not something you're gonna be likely able to do every day of the week. I mean, it's, it's just not practical for most people, I think, but whether it works or not, I don't know. What do you, what are your thoughts on, on how perhaps something we do every day that we all have to do? We all have to eat. We don't, we don't have to take Botox shots around our head, but we all are going to have to eat something. So let's talk about food a little bit. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, diet for the longest time, I've considered it this negative regulator to pattern hair loss outcomes. And what I mean by that is that a really bad diet is going to dysregulate insulin levels. You're going to drive up testosterone. You're going to drive up estrogen. You're going to drive up background inflammation. You're going to see higher degrees of nutrient imbalances. And that's all going to lead to telogen effluvium or hair shedding states. And that if you have pattern hair loss, a bad diet is going to accelerate telogen effluvium based shedding and thereby exacerbate the miniaturization process of male pattern hair loss. But in my opinion, up until, you know, earlier this year, I had never seen an outcome where pattern hair loss had actually been improved through diet alone. And so that's because we know that shedding is more or less inevitable. So if you have androgen activity, if you have the genetics for pattern hair loss, most likely you're going to just end up dealing with it at some point, you're going to have to start to treat it at a very specific level. Um, so you can manage the telogen effluvium sheds, you can manage the chronic telogen effluvium sheds, but pattern hair loss is still coming one way or another. So that had been my opinion for, for years. And on a personal note, I'd experimented with every diet under the sun to try to get my own hair shedding under control. Veganism, vegetarianism, low carb paleo, uh, the Gerson therapy diet, juice and cleanses. I mean, the Ray Pete, Danny Roddy diet. I basically tried everything in desperation to get something working. And um, I never saw significant improvements one way or the other. So in our membership community on our site, we had a few individuals who were trying this crazy diet known as the carnivore diet or an all meat diet. And some of them had been reporting early on these great improvements to hair shedding. Most of them skewed female and females typically have a higher risk of ferritin, uh, low ferritin and iron imbalances, vitamin D deficiencies relative to males. And so while these women had been diagnosed with female pattern hair loss, I thought, okay, well, this is interesting. Um, but, you know, maybe the results that they're experiencing are, are a result of addressing that hair shedding element of the disorder and not the pattern hair loss element of the disorder, the ones that are driven by genetics and DHT and potentially scalp environment. Uh, but the anecdotes kept popping up and um, I can share a few on our screen. Um, these are user submitted photos. They're not incredibly impressive by any means, but they do begin to build this interesting case whereby I began to revise my opinion, um, or at least question my own opinions on this. Yeah, you should be able to share those if you can. All right, let's see. Pop that on there. Okay. Um, can you see this? Yes, we can look, we can see it. Okay. So this is one of the individuals that we've worked with inside of our membership community. The left-hand side is when she started the carnivore diet. The right-hand side is her results six months later. She's also doing stimulation-based therapies and there's lighting differences across photos. So it's really tough to tell, but she was very adamant that her hair shedding had basically completely stopped and that she had seen significant improvements to thickening at the hairline. And she submitted these photos as a demonstration to show us. And so again, these are one of these cases where I was really skeptical. I thought, okay, um, you know, she probably also has telogen effluvium. Any dietary changes that she's making in terms of carnivore diet, well, 
basically red meat is one of the lowest inflammatory foods on the planet. So if she had a food allergen, she's significantly lowered her background inflammation. She's probably normalized her hair cycle that way. And that's what's leading to these results. So I, I was skeptical. Um, and then I came across a post that you had shared on Instagram of this guy. Now this guy, um, really interesting case study. Uh, the upper left-hand corner is what his hair looked like prior to a carnivore diet. And then the upper right-hand corner is his uh, hair just a couple months on the carnivore diet. And then the bottom two are in April, several months after he started. This individual had tried finasteride and had failed to see any improvements whatsoever. So he had lowered DHT, but he hadn't seen any success doing so. And he also ended up developing some side effects from the drug and he stopped using it. So I thought this was interesting. And um, then he went on the carnivore diet and he submitted these photos to you and then you shared them. And it looked like he had potentially recovered a significant amount of hair. I mean, I know you can always make the argument for lighting differences, hair and dryness and angles. But to me, if I'm looking at this objectively, it looks like that bald spot has significantly improved. And I guess what's important to note here is that the, you have to set your expectations for hair loss reversal so low. I mean, there was, there was this Dateline special that came out in 2010 that put a bunch of random men on finasteride. And here's the result that they highlighted after a year. So basically, no improvement whatsoever. Um, you're looking at somebody whose hair loss looks a little bit reduced because if you look at the background lighting, it's in a completely darker room. But essentially, the benchmark for success is a stop in hair loss. So when you see results like this, you begin to ask some questions. And then I had an individual reach out to me who um, had, again, tried finasteride for two years, no side effects, but no success whatsoever. Then in 2017, he and his wife went on this big health kick. They wanted to try this diet, all meat diet, the carnivore diet. They ate ribeye steaks for basically an entire year. And at the same time, he introduced some stimulation-based therapies to hopefully improve his pattern hair loss. And this guy had no evidence of nutrient deficiencies whatsoever. He had a strict case of male pattern hair loss. And over the course of a year, he saw significant thickening to his hairline. He saw some temple improvement. He saw regrowth that, again, is probably on par with a Norwood to a Norwood and a half worth of recovery. And you can always make the argument for these results being a function of the lighting or the angles. But in my opinion, that's another example of clear, discernible hair regrowth. And it really just got me thinking, well, maybe this carnivore diet could potentiate some reductions to hair shedding, but maybe there's also mechanisms at play that beyond just addressing telogen effluvium based shedding could be improving pattern hair loss outcomes. And um, we're about to get into mechanistic territory. So this is all hypothetical. We don't really know, but it's interesting to explore. So uh, we have a small research team at Perfect Hair Health and we were looking at these anecdotes and we wanted to try to look into some mechanistic reasons as to why this might be the case. Um, and so we started to look into a relationship between the gut and the microbiome and um, its influence on DHT production and this relationship between, um, you know, certain androgenic driven diseases like potentially pattern hair loss or heart disease and then the relationship that the gut bacteria has to those diseases. And what we found was that in 2019, this study came out that demonstrated that our gut is basically a massive reservoir for DHT production. And this is something that we didn't know up until very recently. Um, but essentially, when you think about the way that hormones are processed in the body, they circulate through our circulatory system. And then after they're done being used, our body wants to get rid of them. They want to excrete them. And the way that you do that is you take a hormone and you have this enzymatic reaction with something known as glucuronosyl transferase that binds that hormone to glucuronic acid and turns it from more of a lipid molecule into a water loving molecule. And that sends that hormone into the digestive tract, the small intestine, where it can be excreted and sent out, um, you know, and you're done, you don't need it anymore. And so that's the way that your body kind of shuttles hormones out of the system, hormones that we don't need anymore. Um, there was this study 
that was done in germ-free mice versus conventionally raised mice that was later um, replicated to a degree in humans that showed that gut bacteria in the distal colon have the capacity to reverse that process. So they actually can take that glucuronidated DHT, that DHT bound to glucuronic acid that is a functionally useless. It's not gonna have any activity whatsoever. And through a different set of enzymatic reactions, through beta glucuronidase, they can deconjugate that DHT, turn it into its free active form, and that there's actually the potential for that DHT to get recirculated back into the system through the enterohepatic system, where enterocytes, along with the bile acid that they sweep up, also sweep up DHT, gets reprocessed in the liver, and that DHT gets shunted back out into the system to have another effect. And so gut bacteria, in a way, are the gatekeepers of what, back, what DHT gets excreted from the system and what gets potentially recirculated back. And what's interesting is that, you know, well, what's the magnitude of effect here? Well, in a study in humans, circulatory DHT, DHT blood uh, found in the blood, um, they measured DHT levels, unconjugated DHT levels in the feces and compared that to the blood. And they found that the amount in the actual intestinal tract was 70 fold higher than what was found circulating. So that's a really insane finding. It means that, you know, we basically have more DHT that has the potential to bind to things inside of our gut 70 fold more than what's circulating in our system and might have an active effect on our peripheral tissues like our skin. That's really, really crazy to think about. Um, the other interesting thing is that there have been mouse studies now that demonstrate that if you take, um, if you take a male microbiome of a male mouse and you inject it into a female mouse, their serum testosterone levels increase. So just by changing the microbial content of, some, uh, of an organism's gut, you can change the types of hormones that are circulating in their blood. And that's just something that we're really learning about. And the question is, well, what are the implications on pattern hair loss research? And, and we don't ne know yet. But what is interesting is that there have been these crazy results that have been reported from stool transplants. And we know that what goes on in the gut can affect what happens in our hair cycle. Um, with stool transplants, I've got a, another slide here. We've been on that slide for a while. I apologize. Uh, with stool transplants, um, basically there's a set of individuals who have what's known as a colostrum difficile infection. Um, it's basically this thing that kills tens of thousands of Americans each year. It's an antibiotic resistant bacteria. The patient outcomes are awful. Basically you cycle through antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic until none of them work anymore. And then you're basically left on your deathbed. So in desperation to try to fix these things, patients have been asking for for anything that will work for them. And uh, in response, doctors have gotten a little bit creative and they thought, well, if antibiotics don't work, if probiotics don't work to defeat the C. difficile infection, what if we take the, the fecal microbiota content of somebody who's healthy and we inject it into their system? And this is a stool transplant or a fecal microbiota transplant. So they set up this prospective study and they demonstrated that of the patients who received fecal microbiota transplants who were basically left on their deathbed with C. difficile infections, 90% went into remission. And it was really, really fascinating. But the interesting anecdote in relation to hair loss here is that a subset of those individuals had autoimmune forms of hair loss and hair graying, and they ended up reverting a lot of that hair graying and reversing that autoimmune form of hair loss despite having suffered with it long-term and having no other treatments for them work. So there's two examples here. One is this example of a reduction of graying from a case report of somebody who received a fecal microbiota transplant. It's an elderly patient. So you can see some improvement to hair density here. You can see some significant improvement to hair graying um, just as a function of changing the gut microbiome. Another example, which is more extreme, is somebody who had suffered long-term from alopecia areata, had sought dozens and dozens of treatments with no success whatsoever. And once alopecia areata becomes more chronic, um, it's really tough to reverse. This guy, uh, colostrum difficile infection, happened to receive uh, a stool transplant, and there you go. He's regrown a significant amount of his hair. And there haven't been any case reports yet from the medical literature 
in terms of androgenic alopecia or pattern hair loss in this respect. However, there have been some really, really interesting anecdotes on hair loss forums. So this one individual here, it's from a hair loss talk forum post. He had dealt with long-term IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. He had had Crohn's disease. He had dealt with unusual allergies, just had awful, awful um, digestive problems. And he also had pattern hair loss, as you can see in that left-hand photo. And um, he had tried finasteride, no success whatsoever. So he'd cycled off the drug. And then in frustration, ended up seeking his own fecal microbiota transplant um, just to improve his allergies, just to improve his gut health. Now, this is the only anecdote that we have, and it's completely anecdotal, um, so we have to exercise caution here. But he reported a week after receiving this fecal microbiota transplant that his hair started to thicken, uh, or his hair shedding started to reduce. And then a few months later, his hair started to thicken. And he says that now he has not had to worry about pattern hair loss at all. He seeks no treatments. That's his hair photo on the right from just a you know, a year after receiving that transplant. Um, and in my opinion, despite the stylistic differences, you can see that the hair looks just a lot healthier. And it seems like he's really put that pattern hair loss in his tracks. So there seems to be a connection between gut microflora, DHT production, and pattern hair loss improvements potentially, and definitely autoimmune forms of hair loss. So where does the carnivore diet come into play? Well, interestingly enough, Carnivore diet is probably the only diet on the planet or one of the only diets on the planet that uh, can effectively and healthfully remove or almost completely remove a macronutrient group, which is carbohydrates and thereby fibers. And uh, bacteria feed on fiber. Bacteria feed on carbohydrate. They feed on our food sources. So when you significantly lower the amount of carbohydrate and fiber that you eat, you potentiate the possibility that you also drive down the total number of microorganisms that exist in your gut. Now there's also evidence that in addition to driving down the absolute numbers of gut bacteria from carbohydrate restriction, it seems like anecdotally, there's a lot of people reporting improvements to gut biodiversity from the carnivore diet. So not only do you drive down the absolute numbers, but the relative number of species increase. That's associated with a variety of different health improvements. And the hypothesis that we're working on right now, and the one that we're you know, writing about in a literature review, is that by driving down the number of gut bacteria, you're also driving down the number of bacteria that act as those gatekeepers to turn DHT back on and send it back into the circulatory system and thereby have a potentially negative effect on hair follicles. So it's really fascinating. And I have to say that the carnivore diet is the only diet on the planet. And I've been looking at this for well over a decade. It's the only one that I've seen to actually potentiate improvements to pattern hair loss. And it's happening so consistently through anecdotes with photos that um, it's just worth thinking about a little bit more. And one of the things that I'd love to get out of this presentation is if anybody has photos of hair improvements through the carnivore diet, please send them my way. I'd love to get these in a medical journal if possible, even if it's a retrospective case report, even if it's self-reported. I think this stuff is super important and it's, um, it's a fascinating facet of one of the potential benefits of, of an all-meat diet. Yeah, I think, that, again, I've been doing, you know, this kind of participating in this carnivore community now for, I guess, over five years now. And, I, and I've seen you know, not a, an insignificant number of people that have reported either reversal of graying or improvements in hair shedding, or even some, some degree of this male or this, and, you know, androgenic alopecia male pattern uh, improvement. Um, so I'm sure, you know, for you guys who are listening in this community, you know, do so. Um, I guess my thought would be, and, and we don't have much time left, unfortunately, but uh, I don't know how hard it is to get a fecal DHT study done, you know, at, at LabCorp or something. They, they probably don't do that. I mean, there, there's probably a specialty lab that does that, I'm sure. And maybe, um, maybe something through that, that, you know, some researchers that are interested in doing that. If somebody is maybe, I could see that as being an avenue of research. I mean, I, I, maybe that's what you're thinking or something like that and saying, you know, does diet affect fecal DHT? And if it, if it does, does it have efficacy with regard to, to you know, hair, uh, hair recovery? So, um, is that, can you test fecal DHT? I mean, I can't just go to the lab and test that, can I? 
I don't, th- I don't think it's an available test on LabCorp or like True Health Labs or something. Yeah. Uh, but, but there are mechanisms and ways in which you can do it uh, because these studies have done it relatively consistently. Although they had to develop some highly specific mass spectrometry methodologies. So it's not, it's not something that I personally have access to, but it is something that can be done. And to my knowledge, I, I don't want to speak too early, but um, a lot of researchers are interested in this avenue. Um, so the perspective piece, the literature review is there to garner interest. The other element of that is um, if we can actually measure changes to DHT by way of a carnivore diet um, in both the serum and in terms of unconjugated DHT found in the feces, that's a fascinating aspect of research because it absolutely has relevance to androgenic activity pretty much everywhere else in the body. And, and you, you know, like you said, you made the, the ask for people to submit stories, photos to you. How do they do that? How do they get a hold of you to, to sort of, you know, share their, share their progress or their pictures? Um, you can go to our website, perfecthairhealth.com. Uh, there's a contact form there, or you can email me directly at rob at perfecthairhealth.com. Um, I, hopefully I don't get flooded with too many emails. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Uh, but it would be amazing if we did, because that would suggest that there are a lot more anecdotes that have gone undiscovered with this, um, that people can see significant benefit potentially with the carnivore diet. The other thing too, is that, you know, we do have people that we've been working with who anecdotally are doing the carnivore diet. They've noticed reductions to shedding, but they haven't noticed reversals to any degree with pattern hair loss. So it's, it's definitely individual specific. And it seems like certain bacteria species are more likely to leverage that enzymatic reaction for unconjugation of DHT relative to others. Um, It's also context specific. So you can't just look at a single species and say, hey, because this species uh, has the potential to produce beta glucuronidase, then maybe that's the problem. I mean, one of the most interesting facets of the microbiome, to just give you an idea of everything that we don't know, I think we talked about this earlier, is just that um, H. pylori, in the developed world is this ulcer causing bacteria. Um, But in pockets of Africa and in indigenous populations, it doesn't seem pathogenic, it seems commensal. In fact, it helps to reduce iron levels and thereby potentially stave off the severity of malaria infections. So that's a bacteria that in some contexts can be really problematic for individuals and then in others can be life-saving. So it's just such a complicated field of research and we're just scratching the surface here. And I'd be remiss to say that we have even close to any answers. You know, that statement makes, improves your credibility in my view, just because when I see people that think they know it all and have all the answers, you know, I just kind of, I kind of shake my head with that because I know how complicated things are and how, how much context does play a role in all this stuff. Um, one person was asking about, I just wanted to get that in real quick before I have to go. Um, oh yeah. Steve was asking about, you know, you know, men, you know, their, their eyebrows grow, their nose hairs grow, their hairs and hairs on their ears grow. You, you know, and I assume you, you alluded to this, this is a DHT effect. You know, as a DHT is elevated, you get these hairs that you're not, you don't see a benefit. I don't see why having hairy, hairy ears as a 50 year old man is beneficial to me. I'm not sure what's going on with that. But <laughs> I've never investigated nose hair growth specifically, uh, but, but it seems like most of the facial hair growth and chest hair growth in men is at least associated with DHT increases, uh, specifically around those hair follicle sites and in the serum. Um, so there's just that paradoxical effect that, again, nobody really has close answers to. In the past, I've argued that the contraction of those perimeter muscles might be a driving factor. At the same time, there's no way that that can explain all cases. Awesome. Well, Robert, unfortunately, I have to go do another podcast here in three minutes. So I appreciate this today. Uh, maybe we can get you back on as, as you, maybe you find out some more things and hopefully our community will respond and, and give you some more, more fuel for the fire to, to develop this hypothesis and maybe get some more, more data so we can kind of continue to, to learn about this stuff. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity and hopefully we can get some more clinical studies going on this stuff. I think it's fascinating and I, I, I love what you're doing. All right. Well, appreciate it. Uh, for somebody who's asked me how many how many steaks I had, I had four. I had five steaks for breakfast today, so that, that's the answer there. <laughs> About four pounds. So you guys take care. We'll see you later. See you later tomorrow. Bye bye.